Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Ambition, a minuet in power. So we are doing a lot to advance a lot of storylines here. Um, much too much. I mean, at first, it seemed like we weren't doing much of anything, and now all of a sudden, like things are just like flowing. I think I've just been picking up the wrong, uh, the wrong events uh, in the calendar. Uh, no, in the map. Sorry, but here what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through this and finally get into a uh, a meeting with Honorade. Hopefully, this advances the story a bit further. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what's going on with her. We're gal pals, y'all. Gal pals. All right, let's uh, rest because we've got an exhaustion level of two. I imagine after we do this one that the, we'll have an exhaustion level of one after resting again. And I'm undecided of whether or not we want to go and do this. Um, like, I don't know, guys. I don't know. Um, we decided to go to the revolution one here. Perhaps, um... You know what, perhaps what we'll do is we'll decline this one. And then we'll accept this one. And maybe even this one, since they're so spread apart. And what we'll do is we'll not rest here, and we'll actually take the time to do something else in addition. So, direct action and foreign powers. This one was the Armand one. And this one was the Antoine one. Uh, naval architecture. I'm not sure about this one. Um, import and export. I'm imagining that this one and this one, the naval architecture, import, export, I think those are going to unlock a couple of additional characters, perhaps? They, they've shown up a couple of times already at this point. So, um, hmm. This one has a sway in credibility. This one has also a sway in credibility, a sway in monetary value, as well as a sway in peril. Considering this one also adds peril, perhaps this one has another side character. So maybe we'll give this one a try and see what goes. So the description for this one is import and export at the docks. A foreign alcohol importer of dubious legality is looking for someone to help him move his wares. Preferably, they can be moved without interference from the Get Royale. You decide to spend the day walking by the river in order to get some fresh air. As you come upon the docks, you find the beach port to be as busy as usual, with sailors, porters, and merchants moving around like buzzing bees in a hive. One such merchant approaches and greets you in a strongly accented French, Ah, hello, madame. May I ask you a favor? He asks in a lower voice, glancing about. Uh, we can ask him, what do you need, friend? And I'm not sure. I don't do favors for nothing, you see. And is that a cat? Well, I don't know this person, so I'm just going to tell him straight up. I don't do any, I don't do anything for nothing, especially for a stranger. Huh. Of course, I always compensate those willing to help me. I'm Javik, by the way. I'm an ex importer and exporter of beers and fine spirits. You see, what I need you to do is find someone for me around here called Watchman Bernadine. He's tall, very thin, and... <laughs> Declare your goods, orders an approaching Watchman of the Get Royale. His voice is monotone and bored. Root-based spirits. Rakija, to be precise. In fact, it's the finest spirit in all of... <laughs> Manifest! Now, he barks angrily at Jakov, eyeing the cat with some level of discomfort. Save the mongering for the market. Oh. Ugh. Pa paganistic things. You manage to hear the archer mutter to himself under his breath as he makes a small sign of the cross. So this dude, the watchman, he thinks of the cat as the devil or the sign of the devil because he did the, he did the little cross and he called it a paganistic thing. <sighs> oh, I don't think a manifest is necessary. Jackoff replies with an uncomfortable smile. One of your comrades, Watchman Bernadine, and I have an agreement regarding... Bernadine is sick. I'm covering his shift on my day off, the archer replies sternly. Now give me the manifest or I'll be forced to confiscate your wares. 
Jackoff glances towards you significantly, making a small gesture to the archer. So this choice will cost money if we do this. We just want to give this gift to Monsieur Bernadine. Perhaps you would like it instead. Or we can increase peril. Oh, Monsieur Watchman, do you like the cat? Please, let me show her to you. And, well, it appears that you have this whole thing well in hand. I should be on my way. <laughs> I think we'll, uh, we'll give him some money. Pay the bribe. How much is it? Ah, I see. This is the kind of arrangement you were speaking of. While I may be unfamiliar with such things, perhaps I'll be able to learn. The archer replies, his open hand tucked low and close to his body, in a way that suggests a lifetime of practice. <laughs> You've paid 20 livres. Come on, then. Oh, carry on, then, spirit monger, the watchman says with the tip of his hat. Without another word, the archer disappears. Presumably, so he can bother a other people on the docks. <laughs> uh, fantastique, madame. I could not have evaded that officious pig better myself. How can I possibly repay you? Okay, so in my experience, payment for services rendered is traditional. Or, how about some of that rakija that you've touted so much? Ooh. Do we want that? I don't know. Do we want the, the, the alcohol? We're not going to give it to uh, Madame Gazelle. No, because she's recovering, so no. But, I mean, at, a, at this point in time, we don't need 100% that money. But, I mean, who's going to give up money? You know, maybe, the, maybe having the alcohol will unlock something. So let's take that. Ah, oh, you're truly a woman of fine taste, then. He replies, opening a crate to pull out a bottle for you. You don't recognize the writing on the label, but the liquid inside is clear like water. Gained a little credibility. Very nice. Drink it straight, as you would a spirit like brandy, but be careful. Its sweetness is what makes it dangerous, much like yourself, he says with a wink. Now I must get back to work before some other nosy official starts inquiring about any discrepancies between my manifest and my products. So the two of you part ways. Not long after that, you decide to head home with this strange new prize and a powerful sense of satisfaction. June 8th. All right. And here we are. We're gonna rendezvous with Honorade. Yes! Oh, seriously? Aw, oh, man. I did not think that we were going to be using up exhaustion here, but I guess we are. Alright, uh, let's go for something with the bourgeoisie. This is 8, this is 11. Uh, this one's 12. And we're gonna lose 10 for exhaustion, so let's go with this one. We'll just gain 2. Which kind of sucks, but oh well. It is what it is, boys. All right, it'll be, it's a few hours before your rendezvous and you're in your room just starting to get ready. You hear knocking downstairs at the front door. Kumi answers it and you hear an exchange, but the muttering is too soft for you to make out any specifics. A few moments later, Camille enters your room and whispers, um, Madame, Madame Gazelle is here to see you. Don't worry, I'll delay her until you're ready. Before you can reply, Camille sets off to her new task with gusto. But you're not optimistic about her success based on what you hear of her stammered attempts at an argument in the stairway. Some moments later, they enter together with Camille trailing behind Madame Gazelle. Your hapless maid is carrying a large parcel with a bow on it. Yeah, Madame Gazelle is like, she's a, a, a force of nature, this woman. Madame, you have to understand, I tried to stop her, Camille wails softly. It's true, it was a very sweet attempt, Madame Gazelle admits, reassuring Camille with a light pat on the cheek. Satisfied, she sets her focus on you. Bonsoir, Yvette. I've come bearing gifts. The parcel is placed in your hands, and she continues. This morning, I realized that we're almost the same size. I also know that you, ever the social butterfly, are always looking for novel outfits to wear at parties. I looked through my wardrobe and found that I had something that which will look a lot better on you than it does on me. In fact, how would you feel about wearing it tonight? Oh. Well, I've never turned down a nice gift before, and I won't start now. Ah, 
I, but I have something else in mind for tonight. I prefer to wait before trying that on. Or, are you sure that's the only reason you're in my room while I'm still half naked? <laughs> uh, I don't know. W which one do we go? I mean, the funny one is this last one, right? Uh, and she's got she's got a face on her. You know what? Maybe, maybe we'll lose a few points for, with her on this, but let's go for this last one here. Are you sure that's the only reason you're in my room while I'm still half naked? <laughs> she barely conceals a smile. I'd considered it, but this was really more of an unexpected bounty than anything else. Oh, we gained favor. Oh, Madam Gazelle, do you swing that way? Oh, guys, does she swing this way? Oh my god, have I spent this whole time just not realizing that she swung that way? <laughs> oh man, I'm so dense. Go ahead, open it. You open the package to reveal a gorgeous black silk dress. Expensive and rather revealing, it certainly feels in line with the bourgeoisie. You have been gifted on a raid's outfit. Honoraid pulls a pocket watch from her bodice and notes the time before putting it away. It seems that I've already taken too much of your time. If we want to make it to our rendezvous tonight, you'll need some help getting ready. Don't worry, Madame, Camille happily interjects. So that's something I... That will not be necessary, Madame Gazelle interrupts. Your mistress and I shall attend to this ourselves. But... Without another word, Madame Gazelle firmly but politely ushers Camille out of the room. As I was saying, let's get you ready. This, of course, isn't the first time anyone has helped you get dressed before. However, those equations were about comfort and efficiency. A ribbon tied here, a pin pl placed there. You were the one in control. This is different. Being pulled this way and that, being fussily primped and preened without any consultation to you whatsoever. You're not the one in control here. All that seems to matter is whether your appearance pleases her. Alright, so we can say thank you for doing this, or we could smile and say, Oh, Madam Gazelle, I don't think I should be letting you do this. Or stay silent, stay still, and let her do as she pleases. Uh, let's just thank her, I guess. I mean, I guess uh, we're her little doll at the moment. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you're grateful, she replies with a contented sigh. I've always enjoyed dressing others up like this, even when I was a child. She laughs at the memory. Of course, I had no idea why I was doing any of it back then. I just knew that I liked it. I liked being in control of all the details. I liked it even more when they fought back, but I still got my way. You've gained a little favor with Madame Gazelle. You look at yourself in the mirror and you have to admit that Honoraid has good taste. She spent some time adjusting your bodice, but before you know it, these adjustments slowly turn into something firmer and more sensual. Oh! firmer and more sensual. Yet, the moment you start to submit to her touch, she pulls away, leaving you wanting more. Shall we go? She asks in innocently as if it was all your imagination. We, oui, Madame Gazelle. Or, do you always dress up girls in your clothes before you romance them, or am I just special? Or, are you sure, Madame Gazelle? Perhaps we could just stay in. Ooh! Yeah, let's do this last one! Are you sure, Madame Gazelle? Perhaps we should just stay in. <laughs> oh, that is tempting, she leans close to whisper in your ear. But I've already spent far too much effort to have the world miss out on how perf- Oh, I've already spent far too much effort to have the world miss out on how perfect I've made you look. That warm whisper suddenly turns to ice. So you will do exactly as I say. Do you understand? She takes your stunned silence as agreement. Good. I'm glad we understand each other. Gain some favor with Madame Gazelle. Together, the two of you head outside where Renee is waiting you with Madame Gazelle's carriage. She holds the door open for you, and soon the two of you are whisked off to your destination. After spending the first half of the day getting ready, you head out for your rendezvous. Unfortunately, you can feel the exhaustion set in as soon as you step out the door. Tonight is going to be a long night. Ah, we lost credibility because of our exhaustion. Great, just great. 
uh, now I'm even more glad that I didn't accept the other uh, invitation. Because we're really getting low now on the credibility at this point. You return to the fine dining room and crystal chandeliers of La Grande Taverne de Londres. A few aristocrats glance up from the tables at you and take your measure before returning to their splendid food. Ever since you arrived together, Madame Gazelle has been standing far closer than the rules of politeness might allow. It's easy to forget how good she is at looming over people. <laughs> oh, this is very pleasing, she says, looking at you through narrowed eyes as she slowly circles you like a panther. You've done quite well. You have gained a staggering amount of favor with Madame Gazelle. Oh, dear. Turning her attention from you, she surveys your location. <laughs> oh, I absolutely adore this place, Madame Gazelle says with a sigh. The food is exquisite, the lavish decor is excellent, and you know how much I love being served. You've gained some favor. We're, we're maxing out here, boys. We're maxing out on favor. It seems that Madame Gazelle already knows the staff quite well, and they have a solid rapport. She orders for you, but the food that they give you is exquisite. At one point, the owner, Monsieur Bouviers, comes out to speak with the both of you. He cuts a comical figure with his portly stature, twinkling eyes, and a sword on his hip. It seems that he and Madame Gazelle know each other quite well, and he has a special dessert brought to your table as a gift. The two of you split it, but she lets you have the lion's share. A few hours later, you realize that it's starting to get late, and the two of you to depart together. Looking at Madame Gazelle, you feel like today went quite well. Wow! Yo! Nice. Very nice. Alright. This one is for the military. We'll go ahead and accept this. Cool, guys. That was cool. I enjoyed that. Alright, so we've got naval architecture, coffee run, and appointments to keep. You happen to cross paths with a foreign alcohol importer of dubious legality. Here, past actions are accounted for appropriately. Okay, so we're lower on the credibility, so I think we're going to skip that for now. At least until our credibility goes up. Let me check out our gossip for the moment. Got five days old, five days old, and three days old, but they're all cheap gossip, so I'm not sure it's worth taking a whole day for. I think instead what we'll do is we'll do something else. Let's check out this naval architecture. A bespectacled, got it this time guys, a bespectacled traveler with an important appointment to keep is facing some navigational woes. Can you help him find his way? You decide to spend the day walking around in a fountain square simply to cool off. It's sweltering outdoors, stifling indoors, and most people are just trying not to lose their tempers with each other. You swear you can see steam rising up from the fountain. <laughs> at the moment, you're walking easy circles around the fountain, giggling to yourself at a pack of children playing in it. The situation becomes even more amusing when their parents notice and desperately try to shepherd them out of it. <laughs> it doesn't work, and at least one adult falls in during the chase. Your street theater is suddenly interrupted by a man hurtling around a corner and colliding with you. You manage to you manage to keep your balance, but are still a little disoriented. <gasps> oh, my apologies, madame. The man sputters as he collects himself. You're quite certain that you've met this man at a party before. Are you hurt at all? Um... Well, we can say that I'm afraid that I'm a little shaken, monsieur, or it was nothing. I'm sure I'll be fine. I think well, let's ask him why he was in such a hurry. My word, what has you, what has you in such a hurry? He straightens up and adjusts his disheveled spectacles. You see, madame, I'm lost in the city and terribly late for a meeting. I normally work at the coast in La Rochelle, and this is my first time in Paris. I had originally planned to orienteer my way across the city with my handy compass, he says, holding up a well-polished brass compass and a paper map of Paris. However, that plan seems to have been less effective than I'd hoped. He stops to check his pocket watch, then sighs. I'm supposed to be meeting with a draftsman to get the plans for the sunken fortress at Cherbourg, 
At this rate, I'll miss my appointment at the Naval Department entirely. The fortresses are leaking terribly, you see. We made them out of wood, which is apparently quite appetizing to all the sea worms in the port. It was probably something that should have been looked into before we made them. Yeah, you think? Come on, guy. Do you know where I can find the Naval Department? So we can say, I know the city well enough. I can at least help you search for it. Or, monsieur, I frankly have no idea. Or I don't, but perhaps we can find someone who does know. Um, let's ha help him search for it. I'm, f I'm sure we could figure it out. Hmm. Capital, let us be off. Our mission begins anew. Combining your knowledge of the city and his map, you manage to locate the naval office and hurry towards it. A few blocks later, you find yourself outside the stately building. It doesn't look nearly as nautical as you would imagine a naval office to be. There should be simply... There should simply be a stronger nautical theme. <laughs> it's just the naval building. It doesn't mean that it's actually going to be in the water or anything. It's not a It's not a theme restaurant or anything like that. <laughs> Thank you again for your help, madame, he says with a deep bow. If not for you, this entire journey would have been a complete waste. Gain some credibility. Thank you, sir. He departs inside and you're left to your own devices. It's more than likely that you'll return to the Fountain Square to spend the rest of your day to try to overcome the stifling heat. Okay, well, that was that was a cool interaction. I wonder if we're going to meet him again. Alright, so let's see. Uh, point, he got another appointment? Oh, this is the... never mind, this is the other guy. Uh, let's see, let's see. Maybe do we do we expand on uh, Armands or Antoines? Maybe let's go with Armands. We'll we'll go with his storyline a little bit. Foreign powers. After nightfall, you join Armand at his at his home on the other side of Paris. He's promised you a surprise of some sort. You wait until late evening before you walk to Armand's house. He told you that he has something special for you and it isn't related to politics. The very possibility of this brings a giggle to your lips. You're fairly certain that just being engaged to Armand has made you more informed about the political landscape of France than some of the ministers in Versailles. Or Versailles? I don't remember. He can't help talking about it and you soak up knowledge without even trying to do so. When you finally arrive, you knock on the door, but there's no answer. You wait for a while before knocking again, more insistently this time. Come in, the door is unlocked. You hear him call from inside. Well, that's certainly unlike him already. Should men conspiring against the king leave their doors unlocked? <laughs> uh, you, you know, from what I've seen and heard of Armand, I'm not actually not surprised about this at all. You step inside and find the house to be more cleaned up than the last time you were here. It still has the Spartan feeling of an outpost, but at least all the books and papers have been organized into reasonable piles. Armand calls from the direction of the kitchen. Please make yourself at home, ma chérie. You manage to find a seat at the dining room table, which has been cleaned off and has been covered with a fresh tablecloth on it. There's a bottle of red wine already uncorked, which has been left out to breathe on the table. After a few minutes, Armand steps out of the kitchen holding two clay bowls. I hope you're hungry for cassoulet. Dude, why are you shirtless? Like, uh, are you trying to uh, woo your woman back? Pardon moi, but why are you looking at me like that? Uh, oh, I'm just admiring your new choices in fashion. Or were you planning on making yourself decent anytime soon? Or, Armand, what happened to your shirt? I think we're going to go this way. Um, Yvette probably still has some feelings for him still, and this probably riles her up a little bit. And um, But, you know, I don't, I don't know that I feel like he's really done enough to win her back. Just in my opinion. Also, I don't like chest hair. I'm glad I don't have chest hair, but I don't like chest hair. Blick. Personal choice, personal opinion, but black. Oh ho! Ah, uh, yes, that. I can't find our apron, and I didn't want to get my do my clothes dirty right before you came over. Of course, once I started, I quickly learned that we clothe our torsos in the kitchen due to the sputtering of hot oils and fats. 
he says with a wince, and you notice a few tiny burns on his chest and shoulders. Unfortunately, by the time I learned this valuable lesson, my hands were already filthy from working in the kitchen. Quite a predicament, as you can tell. So I decided to play my cards as I'd managed to deal with them to myself. Hopefully, you've at least found some benefit amongst my misfortune, he says with a wink. Oh, I think I'll be able to take some pleasure in this, or I think decency should prevail for the moment. Yeah, let's do that. Because, again, I'm not trying to jump into his bed right now. Huh. Ah, yes, that would make sense. Don't worry, this shall only take but a moment. He says as he sets down the plates at your places on the table. He departs for the kitchen, and you hear the sounds of a man frantically getting dressed. Moments later, he returns wearing his more characteristic attire. For now, you are spared the awkwardness of eating dinner with a half-naked man. Yeah... Like, it's not like he wears very much to begin with. I mean, he just wears his shirt. He doesn't even tie it up. And then he wears a little coat uh, outside of that. And that's not even buttoned up or anything. He's just, like, casual wear. So it's not like it takes a lot. So, come on, man. It'd be different if you were dressed like Antoine or Madame Gazelle or something. He pauses to pour you both some wine. Looking more closely at the bottle, you immediately recognize it as the same vintage that you shared at Le Signet the night before Armand left for Paris. That night feels like a lifetime ago. To long-awaited reunions and chasing our dreams, he toasts. You both clink glasses and drink deep. It tastes exactly as you remember and brings a flood of memories with it. You dig into the hearty stew of duck, sausage, and white beans. It's not hot cuisine, but it's flavorful and satisfying. As you can tell, I've had to learn how to cook myself, and at the risk of sounding arrogant, I have to say I've taken to it quite well. Though, no matter how good I'll get, I must admit that I'll always miss Camille's cooking. That little maid is astonishing in the kitchen. I certainly envy you for still having her. Speaking of which, how are you finding her? I think she's an absolute delight. Or... Is she always so unusual? Does that ever stop? Or, you know, if you miss her so much, you could always visit. I know. I think she's an absolute delight. I really do, though. I think she's like, she's a bubbly breath of fresh air. <laughs> Ooh. Isn't she, though? There were days where I thought her absolutely mad, but I was eventually charmed by her indefatigable defatigable optimism. You've gained some favor with Armand. Conversation dies for a moment while you both finish your meals. At the very end, you use a small hunk of bread to sop up the remaining stew. It tastes absolutely delightful. I wanted to thank you one last time for joining us at our event. I promised to stay away from politics, so I'll not delve into the details. But it was lovely to have your support. Seeing you there made me proud. I also wanted to say I'm very sorry about Johanna. I'm worried about her, and after that night, I think she's been getting worse, not better. What do you mean? He sighs. I know she's not been, she's not given a good amount. Oh my goodness, what is wrong with me? It's not like I drank or anything. I just had some soda before this. Hmm. I know she's not given a good account of herself to you so far, but when we first met, she wasn't like this. She was adventurous, daring, and always so full of energy for the society and our plans. She was inspiring like nothing was impossible. Then again, whenever you came up in conversation, she would find a way to switch the subject, but I just assumed that she was more interested in our work than in personal affairs. No, man. Right from the beginning, she was out for your duck sausage, you know, man? She's been after you this whole time. She just knew that you were talking about politics was making you happy. And uh, talking about Yvette, that definitely did not make her happy a bit, at any bit. And it's just been going on like that. The night after our event, she and I had a serious quarrel. She started screaming about everything she'd sacrificed. She kept saying that this was her last and only chance. She's sp barely spoken to me since then. I understand at least some of it. She single-handedly financed this whole venture. Yeah, for you, dude. Like... Yeah, maybe, maybe I was dense about Madame Gazelle, but you're even more dense, my guy. I suppose that gives her some right to be controlling, or to the devil with her, you're not her servant. 
And what do you think she meant by last and only chance? That is very... That is very uh, mysterious. Like, that is intriguing, too. Like, what did she mean? Hmm. He pauses to think, dredging up old memories and viewing them in a new light. While I don't know for certain, my theory is that she had bankrupted herself funding the society. She mu also must believe that some great reward awaits her at the end of this, and if this fails, then she will be left with nothing. Yeah, she probably was chasing you, chasing your tail. But then again, I don't know, maybe also she was like some Austrian spy, and she needs this to work because... It's her only way back into the Austrian nobility or something? I don't know. Gained a little favor with Armand. Together, the two of you easily finish the bottle of wine, and without skipping a beat, Armand produces another one, nearly identical. He refills both of your glasses. This dinner brings with it an almost overwhelming sense of familiarity, like the conversations you had in the village together only took place but a few minutes ago, and you're just now picking up exactly where you left off. You look up from your wine to see Armand staring at you with a ferocious intensity. It appears that the dinner is over, yet I believe we are still hungry. Um, I think I can help with that. Let me clear the table and then kiss him. Or that may be so, but I feel like it would be best to wait and don't kiss him. I think we're going to go that way, guys. He thinks he can wine and dine like just all of a sudden and just like he's done a lot to be out of favor you can't just easily win your way back like this with you know a homemade dinner and some wine and just think that you'll get back into uh, her panties like that that's that's just not how it's gonna work and like I could see past his whole you know taking working around with his shirt off and stuff like that come on man you know I don't know. I'm sure there are women that fall for that. I'm sure that there are men that fall for that, but I feel like you've been smarter than that. As you wish, my dear. I am but a slave to your whims and the throes of passion, Armand says as he stands up and begins to clear off the table. Also, just thinking about it now, the last time he sent you a letter was for the Habsburgian Society, and, like, usually... Like, Yvette even found, like, normally, there, he writes so many pages, like, four or five, and she was, like, she only got one page, and she was like, what happened to the rest of them? Like, y you're, you're barely even trying, my guy. You're barely even trying. I, in fact, I'm not even, I'm not even sure I would categorize it as trying. As you take your plates, he gives you a light kiss on the forehead before departing for the kitchen. Gained a little favor. Ma chérie, he calls from the kitchen. If you don't mind, I'm going to take some of these leftovers upstairs to Johanna's room, just so she has something to eat when she gets back. It might serve as a decent olive branch. You shrug and leave it to him. You're not exa exactly dying of thirst, after all. Upstairs, you hear the sound of breaking pottery, followed by a string of frantic cursing. Armand runs downstairs, eyes wide with shock. Johanna's room is completely empty. She must have moved out completely in the middle of the night. That, that is not a good sign. No, it's not. Uh, she, yeah, man, she, uh, always reala realize that the, like, at the last, po uh, actually, beyond the last po possible second, he grimaces and pulls at his hair. I'll look into this later, but I'm going to tell you a secret just in case. He sits down near you and hands you a letter from his pocket before continuing in a low voice. Johanna Dujardin's real name is Johanna von Holbein. She doesn't yet know that I learned this about her. Yeah, she's... Yeah, maybe she she is Austrian or something. You look down at the letter and see the, real, see the name Johanna von Holbein in the signature, but you can't read the rest of it as it's written in German. German? I researched the name a little on my own, and to my knowledge, it appears that the Von Holbeins are an Austrian noble family in deep decline. I called it! Oh my god, Austrian nobility! It might explain why she started the society, as she might hope that it could reverse her family's fortunes. I still believe in the righteousness of our cause, but it's likely what has kept her so driven. 
You think about the signet ring of hers that you found in the house. The mysterious sigil is likely her family's crest. She wanted Armand to have it because it would be enough to have people in Austria help her. That means her family must still be relatively well known. Huh. So they know her, but she bankrupted herself, likely, in setting up the society. I'm telling you this because I'm worried that she might do something extreme. Johanna may be a lot of things, but forgiving is not one of them. If something occurs, we should be prepared. Ah, man, I need to start reaching out to everyone else in the society. I need to make sure that they're still safe. I'm sorry, Miss Cherie, but I'll need to depart immediately. If it's any consolation, I'll be able to walk you halfway home. Outside, the two of you walk together in an awkward silence. The mood of the evening has certainly taken some sharp turns. Finally, as you find yourself around halfway home, Armand turns to you and says, I believe this is where we must part ways. Good night, my love, and please be sure to stay safe. With a kiss on the cheek, he departs into the night to rally his fellow Habsburgians. As he disappears into the darkness, you wonder when you'll see him next. Whoa, some like serious stuff going on there with Johanna. I personally, personally, I don't really care, but whatevs. It's not like I really cared about her anyways. She's kind of a B, man. A total, utter B. Alright, so what have we got? We still got the thing with Antoine. Uh, I th mm, maybe we can do this one with the, uh, the quote-unquote importer. Appointments to keep. You happen to cross paths again with a foreign local importer of dubious legality. Here, past actions are accounted for appropriately. Alright, you find the streets today to be especially crowded, even into the dwindling hours of the early evening. Perhaps these people have nothing to occupy their spare hours with other than wandering the streets. While this wouldn't normally be an issue for you, you find yourself caught up in these crowds, and it soon becomes difficult to do anything other than go with the flow of traffic. You feel like a piece of flotsam caught in a river's currents. As you get bumped around, you suddenly find yourself face to face with Jackoff, the man you met at the docks. <laughs> ah, Madame Duco, it's great to see you again. You enjoyed the Rakija then, I take it? It's funny that I've run into you again when I found myself in another predicament. I've recently received party invitations from two of my clients, but on the same day. One is a prominent noble near the crown, the other is an influential revolutionary. I can only attend one of these functions, and whoever, whoever I meet will likely gain the social benefits of my fine wares. I've been thinking myself in circles about it. Whose event do you think I should attend? Oh, definitely go for the revolution, my guy. Except the revolution's invitation. They love new and exciting things. Huh. Ah, that is a good point. Hopefully my steady stream of exotic spirits will help my revolutionary client be a little more popular and that good business will follow. Revolution has gained some power! Power to the people! Now, as much as I would like to stay in chat, Yvette, I must be off. I have some last deliveries to oversee. Also, it's almost Dusso's dinner time. He says, scratching his, his cut, his, oh, scratching his cut under the cat's chin. And he meows in agreement with this assessment. With that, he leaves, easily pushing his way through the crowd. Night has fallen by the time you manage to escape the throng and get home, but that's no matter. You manage to benefit from a truly unique opportunity. Alright, so we're increasing the power to the revolution, which I think is a good thing. And we got one day before the event that we have decided to go to, so let us rest. Yeah, we've got fewer things here on the map now, so let's just rest for this new event. Alright, we're gonna take the day off, no longer exhausted. Alright, so now we shall get dressed for our party. Oh, what's this? Oh, it's from Honoraid. Share Yvette, if you would please it would please me if you joined me on June sixteenth for a day spent at La Grand Tavern de Londres. Let's accept it, my guys. Oh, and something from Anjuan. On June 19th, 
You should join me on June 19th for a day spent at Le Grand Dunche de Roy. Okay, we'll accept that. Oh man, we got a lot of stuff all of a sudden just rammed up in a row here. Okay, well, let's uh let's go to this ball being held by the church. All right, so let's see. This is plus no, this is minus 12. 0 0 oh, minus 11, minus 8, plus 3. And minus 19. Alright, so we're gonna need to buy a dress for the church sometime soon. Um, I need to remember that, but I, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to remember that. Um, yeah. Uh, we'll just... Yeah, let's... I'm... Alright, let's just head straight for the party. Alright, credibility up just a little bit. Let's spend 10 Libres, you guys. Now we're up at 32, no, 92 credibility and 35 peril. All right, now let's get rolling. We be rolling, rolling, rolling. Lost coin, this is the one where we try to steal, I assume. An imposter, you catch, you catch sight of the strange doppelganger that you spotted before. The time has come to put an end to this loathsome charade. I thought we took care of this already. Is she back to her old ways? A lovesick priest. You come across the priest, off in a corner, hiding from other guests. He seems bookish and shy, but also quite sweet. Something about him feels like it bears some further investigation. And holier than thou, your presence has, hasn't gone unnoticed by those who consider themselves extremely pious. For some unbelievable reason, they doubt the honesty of your intentions here. This might be an ideal chance to turn such attacks around on them. Let's um, let's open up uh, this one for Ludovico. Um, I mean, why not? Exploring the party, you find yourself in a quiet room that the other guests seem to have forgotten about. Right as you're about to leave, you hear the rustling of paper. Slowly and carefully, you check behind the door. That's where you find a priest reading a book. Suddenly noticing you, he leaps up with a shout. Figlio de putana! You know that wasn't French, but you're certain- you're fairly certain it wasn't polite. Yeah! Um, I don't know if you guys- any of you guys know, um any Spanish or Italian, but um, if you know of the the dish um, uh, putanesca, I think you know where this goes with, so yeah, so yeah, I'll just leave it at that, guys. <laughs> that's, that's on you guys to figure that one out. I'm so sorry, madame. You just startled me. Who are you? Are you all right? Uh, forgive me, father. That was my fault. My name is Yvette. Or, I'm Yvette Ducot. What are you doing here? Trying to uncover our host's terrible secrets? Or examine his book? Let's examine the book. The book is bound... The book is bound is faded red leather, and while it's well read, doesn't appear to be a Bible. You try to keep your facial and facial expression neutral when you recognize the book. La histoire extrament vers de Jules de Abuni. It's a romance, the tawdry kind, filled with rebellious and wanton women. Certainly a fun read, but not what you were expecting. Yeah, so it's a trash... It's a trash novel, guys. <laughs> he notices your wandering eyes. My French is still rusty. This one was easier to read than the others. And then uh, we can say, well, at least you found something exciting. I love the horse chase near the end. <laughs> so Yvette's read, Yvette's read this one. We, oui, Father Sidoti, would you like some help finding something more appropriate? Nah, let's just, let's, maybe maybe he'll open up to us if we, know, if we tell him that we kind of know this book too. <laughs> he glances down at the book and blushes. It's been fun so far. I love the escape from the nunnery. Gained a little favor with Little Vico. Please let me introduce myself. I am Father Sidotti, he says with a polite nod of his head. His expression goes blank for a moment, and he examines your face carefully. You're Yvette Ducot, are you not? You certainly match your description. Ah, what am I doing? I beg your pardon, Madame Yvette. I swear I'm normally more social. 
It's just that my recent assignment has been rather unbearable. And we can ask him, is that why you're hiding in a quarter and reading? Or unbearable? How so? Or assignment? What are you doing here exactly? Let's just, uh, let's just lean into the unbearable part and figure out why. Huh. Recently, my superiors in Rome assigned me to interview one Monsieur Balland. We're trying to form a complete picture of the situation in France. Tonight, I've tried to speak with him, but he's awful. I've never met a man so determined to see the worst in everything. We can respond. Oh, he can't be that bad, can he? Or, so you're saying that I can be as rude as I like to him and it won't change anything? Or, is there anything I can do to help? Let's help him out. I mean, he seems like a nice guy. Uh -huh. While I appreciate any help you can provide, I just can't think of what you could do, he admits. The man is utterly incorrigible. Gained a little favor with him. But please, enough of my martyrdom. What brings you here? Just looking for something exciting to do. Or, Father, I'm just here to show off my report, support for the church and its good works. Or, I'm just mostly looking for any way to get ahead, honest or otherwise. The wine's nice, too. I think the way that Yvette's going, she's just, she kind of is trying to get ahead. But I, the way that I've been playing her, I don't think we're kind of just doing it for her anyway. But at the same time, I mean, we kind of are doing things underhandedly by selling um, rumors and swaying public opinion and stuff. I mean, so we kind of are doing it underhanded. But you know what? I don't want to think about that. I just want to think about the fact that we're not uh, uh, personally screwing people over face to face. <laughs> just looking for something exciting to do. Hmm. So am I, he replies with a twinkle in his eye. Though, I think things are already getting better. I will gain a little more favor. At the moment, a dour and unsatisfied looking man enters the room, his brow knit in a permanent furrow. I stand corrected, Father Sedate mumbles to you. Oh, this must be the dude. Ah, uh, there you are, Father Sedote. I thought you had gotten lost. This building is rather poorly designed, you see. Yeah, Monsieur Balan. Is this lady bothering you? Please don't. Please don't mind me. Finish your interview. Or, easy credibility. I'm sorry, Monsieur Balan, but he is assisting me with a matter of faith that can't wait. <laughs> or we could add a little peril. No, I'm not, Monsieur. You see, people have come to parties to actually enjoy themselves. Ooh, ooh. If I were playing like. If I were playing, like, you know, badass at that, that's what I would go for. But for now, I think I'm going to go with this credibility challenge. I'm sorry, Monsieur Belland, but he is assisting me with a matter of faith that can't wait. Hmm. A matter of faith? Oh. Ah, yes. I suppose your inconveniences would have to take priority over my interview, Monsieur Belland replies, trapped by the needs of propriety. He leaves, grumbling something about feminine inconstancy or the like. You... you actually got rid of him. That was amazing, he says, astonished. You've gained some favor. The two of you chat for a little bit longer and seem to get along quite well. Father Sadati is remarkably well-wed. Well-wed? Am I once again, uh, Elmer Fudd? It's well-read, Dan. Well-read. Father Sadati is remarkably well read, and you never expected to find yourself discussing Voltaire and Goethe and. Goth? I don't know. I know I've seen this name before, but I can't remember how it's pronounced. With a Catholic priest. <laughs> By the way, the next time we see each other, I would actually prefer if you called me Ludovico, if that's alright. Gained a little favor with him. With that, he gives you a short bow and leaves to attend to other matters at the party. What a sweet man. Hopefully I'll see him soon. Or, hmm, I don't know how to feel about him yet. Or, something bothers me about that priest. I think he was a nice guy. But as they say, nice guys finish last. With the priest on your mind, you leave the now abandoned room to explore your other opportunities at the party. Alright. Oh, we can get another thing with him here. Let's check what the, what's other stuff here. An imposter. I thought we took care of this already. She said she wasn't going to impersonate us anymore. Feigned acquaintance. 
Uh, someone is absolutely bursting at the seams with a desire to discuss something s concerning the host, but only with those who know the host well. Eh. Holy intrigue. A rather run-of-the-mill interaction with a pious woman at a party. You might find yourself having many like it in the future. I think we'll just go further with this Ludovico one. So we'll just continue on with him here. You find yourself chatting with Ludovico, but he seems more weary than usual. Ludovico, are you alright? Or am I boring you then? Or Father Sadati, the hostess is possessed. What should we do? <laughs> Let's just ask him if he's alright. I don't know that he's the type to uh, like mess around like that. What? Oh, excuse me, uh, Yvette. I must have drifted off. I've spent several nights meeting with the first estate's representatives from for the estate's general. The parish priests from the country want changes to benefit the people who are starving in the streets, but the bishops and deacons in the cities are all from noble families and don't want to accept the current order. They administer their churches like their own personal estates. We're supposed to be agents of the Lord, unified by our mission to protect the souls of our flocks, but it seems like that's too much to hope for. I admit, I have my own biases, but they're informed by scripture. After all, the Lord himself said, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That... I've actually never heard that saying before, but yeah, rich people tend to have the ability to be their worst selves. Uh, not to say that they're all like that, they just have more of an opportunity to allow for it. Because if you're only ever fighting for survival, you're not really thinking about the moral fiber of your being. You're just thinking about your base instincts in order to survive. Whereas rich people, they don't have to generally deal with that. They have their basic needs met, and they have the ability to think about the moral things that they're doing and still do them regardless of what they find. But again, not all of them. There are some decent rich people, I guess. I've never met any rich people personally, so I can't say one way or the other. I understand that much of the Bible's wisdom is difficult to interpret, but that part feels pretty straightforward to me. Still, I've been charged with looking out for the church's best interests in my reports back to Rome. I want them to see that the time has come to start picking sides, but I need to make sure that it's someone that already has a harmonious relationship with us. Of course, whoever the Catholic Church makes overtures to will gain a little power, even if that faction's own relationship with the Church doesn't actually change. Neutrality in the face of suffering is not something we can afford. Your, the crown brings stability, the stability is safety, or your desire to help people, Ludovico. Tell them of the tell them of the good the revolution could bring. Let's go this way. We're just pushing everybody toward the revolution. Screw the crown! Huh. Really? You think they'd truly be receptive to supporting the revolution? <sighs> that can't be right, Yvette. Are you sure that's who the church favors? He says, shaking his head. Damn! Lost credibility and lost some favor. Regardless, I suppose it does make sense for us to begin to support the revolution. They have the people's inter best interest at heart. He says, nodding along. This will most certainly help the revolution. Right, so the revolution gained a little power and the crown lost a little power. You chat with Ludovico a little longer, but eventually the two of you have to part ways. After all, you both have more things to take care of before the night is over. Now, let's see if there's time for you to get up to anything else. There is not. That is the end of that party. So, we did make out with five Ludovico favorite in total. So that's something. And um, our credibility, I guess, didn't quite go up, didn't quite go down. I mean, it's it's tough, though. Credibility is starting to fade pretty quickly now. <laughs> All right, we're now in June 14th. Uh-oh, you look up at the sound. Oh, is it time for the rent? Hmm. Yep, rent is due as our wages. Huh. All right. You can go ahead and take care of that with the money. All right. And as for you guys, you guys can come back next time. I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and I hope that you will come back for the next one. I hope to see you there. And until then.
Bye.